continuing to, to look at the, the number plane and locus. But this time what we're looking at is functions. You see, we normally have our number plane. We substitute in a value, usually an x value, put it into the function, and we get an output. The range is the y value. The thing is now, if we want to put into a function, we're putting in something which has a real part and an imaginary part. And we're already using the number plane to represent that point. So we're going to put that into a function and it's going to spit out another number which will have a real part and imaginary part. So technically we need a four-dimensional number plane, which of course doesn't exist in our three-dimensional world. So that's okay, don't worry, I'm not going to make you draw up a four-dimensional number plane. So what we end up doing for this is we have one number plane for the input, one number plane for the output. So a little bit different. So omega is going to be some function of z. We're going to substitute in z and it's going to spit out numbers. They're going to be our omega, our, our range, if you like. And then we'll be asked to find what is the locus of, well, it might be omega, it might be z, just depending on the question. But they'll give us some condition for omega or z. So the trick is we try to make the condition the subject of the formula. So whatever they've placed the condition on. So some common things we see. They might say the condition is, so the output is only going to be real numbers. So the omega is going to be purely real. So what can we take from that? Well, we know then that the imaginary part must equal zero. That's one thing we could think of. Or we might think of it in terms of its argument. The argument's going to be zero or pi. They might tell us that the output's going to be purely imaginary. In that case, the real part would equal zero or the argument would be plus or minus pi on two. Now this sort of one here, it's hard to describe it. If you see argument of, and you've got a fraction, and on the top is a linear function, it might be z minus two, z plus three, whatever, and on the bottom of the fraction is another one, z plus something, and that's gonna equal some angle. That will turn out to be an arc of a circle. We'll look at some examples, we'll see how this works. Now, how do I tell what type of arc? If that angle, theta, is bigger than pi on 2, then it will end up being a minor arc of a circle. If it's less than pi on 2, it'll be a major arc of a circle. And if it's equal to pi on 2, we'll get a semicircle. Let's look at some examples then. So here's the function. So they want us to find the locus of w if w is z plus 2 on z. But the condition they've placed on it is modulus of z equals 4. So our input, the z, would be the circle, centre zero, uh, radius four. If we were to grab every single number on that circle and substitute it into this function, what would we get? What would the output look like? That's what this is saying. So there is our function, w equals z plus two over z. Make the condition the subject. The condition is on z. So I want to rearrange this and make z the subject. So ZW is Z plus 2. Factorise, divide. So now I can see what the output's going to look like. Because we've said the condition is the modulus of Z is equal to 4. Therefore, the modulus of the right-hand side must equal 4. Right, let's play around with this to see what we've got. Absolute value of 2 is obviously 2. Turn it upside down, I get modulus of W minus 1 equals a half. I recognise that. It's also going to be a circle. B circle, but the centre will be at one, and the radius is a half. Now, the one thing we need to check, though, it would not be possible to substitute z equals zero into this function. But that doesn't matter for our output, because our output's on w's, it's not z. But if they were to ask us, I've never seen this question asked, to be honest, but theoretically, if they were to ask us the domain of this function, well, we know that z can't equal zero. This time, they want us to find out what the input is, that we're being told the output is only going to be real numbers. So what are we substituting in to get that sort of result? The function is z plus 1 on z minus 1. Fortunately, w is already the uh, subject of this, so I don't have to play around with it. It told me it's purely real. Okay, we're well, not really sure. Let's sub in the x plus i y's and see what happens. And we're expanding out. Boy, boy. But 
You'll notice I haven't gone any further with that. I haven't bothered expanding the whole top out because I know if W is purely real, then the imaginary part is equal to zero. So the only thing I'm interested in is the imaginary part. So I'm only looking at the things that have an eye with it. The denominator I don't care about either. Because when you're saying something equals zero, fraction equals zero, it's got to be the top of the fraction. So I'm just looking at those bits. So in other words, minus x plus one times y plus x minus one times y must equal zero. Well, that's simplified it down a little bit. Let's play around with it a bit more. Uh, the xy's cancel. Oh, we just get y equals zero. But again, go back to the original question. In this case, I do have to consider some points that I can't substitute in. Because W is equal to Z plus one on Z minus one. So therefore Z can't equal one because you can't have zero on the bottom of the fraction. So on our picture, it would exclude the point one zero. Real part is one, imaginary part is zero. There is another way of doing that. Let's use the argument idea. If W is purely real, then the argument is zero or pi. So the argument of Z plus one on Z minus one equals zero or maybe pi. So let's break it up. Argument of Z plus one minus the argument of Z minus one is zero or pi. So we've got these two vectors. Both of them are gonna be joined to Z, but we know the difference in their arguments is zero. Therefore, they have gotta be parallel. But hang on, they've got a common point of Z so they're not just parallel, it's got to be collinear. We've got a straight line here. Or pi, same deal, because all that means with pi is the difference is 180 degrees. The vectors are pointing in opposite directions. So from that, I can see I've got a straight line. Let's draw a picture. Okay, so we've got one minus one. I need to place Z somewhere so that the difference between the two vectors is either zero or pi. Well, let's have a look at that one. The first one's joined up to negative one, the second one's joined up to one. If they were going in opposite directions, they would have a difference of pi. So it's the complete line. But, oh, I've got two points of exclusion. The other answer said I've got one point of exclusion, which is right. So it's saying, yes, it's y equals zero, the x-axis, but excluding both plus or minus one. This is where you always go back to what was the original question asking. So you just have a look at both of them. Well, if Z is plus one, no, it doesn't work. So yes, we do exclude that one. If Z is negative one, well, we get zero over negative two, which is zero. Is zero a real number? So we would include it. So go to the original question. See, the thing is, it's another one of those situations where we have changed the actual question they asked for. It's like when we're solving equations. So square both sides, you get new answers that aren't actually answers. Same deal here. I've changed the question to something that I want to play with. And this is the correct answer. If they had said the argument of Z plus one on the argument of Z minus one was zero or pi, that would be the correct answer. Because if it was, going into that, you'd have, what is the argument of zero? Well, zero doesn't have an argument, because you haven't gone anywhere yet. So it would be correct for what I've changed it to. But that wasn't the original question. So double check, go back to the original question, make sure you've got those exclusions correct. Locus of Z is the argument of Z on Z minus four is pi on six. What have we got? So the argument of Z on Z minus four is pi on six. It's like saying omega is equal to that argument. We just haven't put the pro numeral there. So the output is gonna be this argument. If I split it up, it becomes more obvious why we end up with the arc of a circle. Remember we said it's gonna be an arc of a circle, linear function on linear function. We're saying the difference between the two arguments is always pi on six. Go to the picture. I'm gonna join Z up to zero, because that's the argument of Z, and four. Now you're probably wondering, why did he draw them down there and not up there? Probably because I know what the final answer is gonna be. Uh, but we're saying the difference in those two is pi on six. The angle between those is pi on six. Think back to circle geometry. Angles in the same segment are always equal.
So we're saying it does not matter where that point of intersection is, it's always going to be pi on six. So if I was to plot every possible point, I must end up with the circle because of that circle geometry theorem. Why did I put it below? Because the argument of z is bigger than the argument of z minus four. The reality is when I actually do these, I would put it on top first. I put it bottom because I know what the answer is. So let's imagine that instead of putting z on the bottom, there's four, let's say I place it up here. And we're saying that angle is pi on six. Now it's a little bit more obvious. Argument of z minus the argument of z minus four is pi on six. But the argument of z is that one there. Argument of z minus four is that one. But that's the exterior angle of the triangle. That angle has to be bigger than pi on six because it's the exterior angle of the triangle. But look at what we're saying. We're saying the argument of z is bigger because when I subtract, I get pi on six. So clearly z cannot be above the axis. The only other logical conclusion is it's below. Well, why does it work when we're below? Because we're talking about negative numbers now. When you go below, the argument of z will be minus that angle, but then you're gonna go minus, minus a bigger angle, which becomes plus the bigger angle, you get a positive number. So that's how you tell whether you're above or below. Now, how am I gonna find the equation to this? I know it's a circle, and that's the arc of a circle. What's the equation? I need two things for an equation, don't I? I need a center, and I need a radius. Well, if that's an arc of a circle, that line, the x-axis, that joins those two points must be a chord of the circle. And we know perpendiculars from the center bisect the chord. Yeah, back to circle geometry again. Okay. Perpendicular drawn from the center of a circle to a chord will always bisect the chord. Therefore, the x value of the center must be two because when I draw a perpendicular from the center, it's got to bisect the chord. So the center is underneath, bisects it, so it's got to be vertical. Chord's horizontal, that line's got to be vertical. I know its coordinates are two y. Oh, by the way, how did I know the center of the circle was below the axis and not above the axis? Because we're looking at a major arc. So the major arc of a circle, the center, would be in the segment that we're gonna draw. If it was a minor arc, then the center would have to be on the other side of the chord. Okay, how do we now work out the y value? There's the radius. We don't know what that is yet, we've got to work that out as well. But we know that angle there is 30 degrees. Some more circle geometry. The angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference. So if the angle at the circumference is 30 degrees, that whole angle at the center must be 60 degrees. But of course, we've chopped it in half, so that little bit's 30 degrees. So we now can say that y over two is the tan of 60. I'm referring to the other angle over there. So we now know the y value. Well, no, we don't. We know the distance, because y is below. So our y value will actually be negative two root three. We have our center. Two, negative two root three. Radius, Pythagoras. Radius squared will be two squared plus two root three squared. Four. We now can write our answer down. The locus is the major arc of the circle, and I've put the equation of the circle down there. X minus two squared plus Y plus two root three squared equals 16, formed by the chord joining zero, zero, and four, zero, but not including these points. Another way you could say that, it's that circle, but for Y values that are less than zero. That would explain it as well, because you're saying you're below the axis. So you could do it that way as well.